Okay. Nasreen, thank you so much for joining us today from Hong Kong. Um, I, uh, I'm so happy that you were able to participate. Also, you're in charge of a whole architecture program, and I think there's uh, quite, a, quite a lot of stuff happening in Hong Kong that you might tell us a little bit about, whatever you see from your window, or have you left your house yet? <laughs> uh, good question, Ruth, as usual. Um, it's great, it's great to, um, to be with you. Um, even though we're what we're about 12 and a half hours away from one another that makes it uh, more than uh, more than the usual new york paris uh, commute that i was making at the time that i was teaching at columbia and you were at columbia um i'm not uh, i'm not directing the program anymore the i'm not the head of the program anymore in hong kong uh that was a two-year thing that I did when I first came, and now I'm a full professor, and I have the luxury of being able to give all of my time to the student as opposed to signing papers and leave and uh, sabbaticals and whatever <laughs> for for all the for all the teachers. Um, I I think if so, I may say so, you had your fair share of admin in your career. I mean, you were my professor at Columbia University and you were one of the master studio instructors at the, f at the first year when everything went digital at Columbia. And I was so lucky and so happy to, it was a lottery system and I was so lucky that I got into your studio. And I will always remember the time you made us build this huge model of the High Line, or half of Manhattan actually. And my roommate Kathy was sleeping <laughs> underneath the table and it was just such a fantastic experience. But I mean, you taught all over the place. You were in Cornell, you were, later I met you again at the AA. Tell us something about how you became a teacher. You also have a practice. We're gonna discuss how you juggle both of it later, but tell us about how did you get into teaching so heavily and, and what attracted to you to the different schools? Uh, well, you know part of the story. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't something that I had planned. I hadn't planned to get to um, to teach so much as I did, as I have, and I and I maybe continue to do. I, I'm not teaching as much as I used to um, at the time that I was at Columbia, because if you remember, at that time I was teaching both at DA and at Columbia, therefore two schools parallel uh, to one another. I think that. Um, as everybody, uh, as in everybody's career, as everybody, as every, not everybody, but as every architect, I think that there is somehow a sort of a, uh, not just a career, but a, but a, but a, but a um, practice, which also needs an alter ego. Uh, and for me, the sort of the, uh, the practice that I was in, which was a very marginal one at the time, because I was, you know, one person winning one competition at the same time that I won the competition, I was also coming to teach in Colombia. And so um, it was a very tiny, small sort of office, which started to grow um, in the years after that. And the same thing with, uh, with, uh, with teaching. It was something that I started as a, as a teacher at the AA, but then it started to grow. Now, if one takes that as a sort of as a as a given, then I think that I also um, was interested in superimposing a series of different conditions with one another. So it was not a programmatic condition; it was not an architectural condition, but it was the students that were at the at Columbia at the time and the students that were at the AA. You all had very very different ways of looking at this world, and I think that what was quite uh, amazing for me was to be the sort of the in the middle of uh, a bunch of students 12 students or I can't remember if we were 12 or 13 if you were 12 or 13 at Columbia and about 15 in at the AA so about 30 students that have different backgrounds that are in two very reputable important uh, educational sort of um, uh, systems of the time uh, in the early 90s um, <clears throat> uh, and the world is going through as you said yourself the world is going through a sort of a revolution of from 
the analog to the digital. Uh, architecture is playing with that. And uh, I find myself in a position whereby I'm lucky enough to have 30 students with different backgrounds, with different ways of thinking, looking at the same problems, looking at the same issues. And I think that um, this uh, was a way of allowing me to think about practice differently. So my part of it, my sort of, if, if we want to call it uh, sort of uh, my, the, the part that is ego testicle in terms of my situation, but also for the students to see this, to bring the students together. And that's why exactly what we did was to actually cross you, uh, mean, meaning your group, with the with the with the um, uh, English group English they weren't English students but to bring them together for one looking at Manhattan the other one looking at the meat market in 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 London and uh, seeing what conditions change how these uh, cultural sort of uh, backgrounds can bring uh, what they what can they bring into architectural education so this is something that really interested me at the time and sort of making that making at the time and still how does one cross different cultures in those places that are supposedly all of the same um, pedigree because ivy league schools uh, in america and good schools in europe and good schools in china now and good schools in africa good schools in uh, south america uh, if one brings them together, if you bring the, the what makes those schools, which are the students, it was uh, it's quite important to see how the operation of architecture changes in these places. And that's one of the things that really interested me, both at the time and it still does. How it superimposes these complexities, you know. And, and you really did, because I was fascinated about how different the approach of the let's say students in London boss and you you reunited me with a very good friend from from my school days Miko Miko remember <laughs> and all mm -hmm. of a sudden we were together again but but we had this kind of very Colombian approach like um, being very analytic and being very uh, you know uh, very mathematic about our approach and about our uh, concept and I had the feeling that Columbia, uh, that at the AA they were trying more. They were more, uh, uh, you know, not, I'm not saying subjective, but they were, they were more playful, and um, it was super interesting to to just see the difference and also go back to that again and not be so, you know, stuck up in in whatever we were taught there. So um, I thought it was an amazing experience. Besides from you know uh, traveling and uh, living on a, on a boat on the Thames and stuff like that. <laughs> It was great. Yeah, yeah, and also there was a very interesting thing. I mean, it was one was um, the way that we did this, the way that we got uh, you and the uh, and the um, and the AA students to choose one another. The way that we we played uh, a game. Uh, everybody played the game. Uh, we sent out faxes. We said something. We said something. You, each of each of you, the students, you said something about the respective sides of one another, and it was a it was a choice coming together. At the same time, what was very um, it was open because you could change your minds if you wanted to. But also, I think one of the things that I really thought was new, both at the time but even now, was to be able to, at the time of the reviews to separate each of you from your own work and get somebody else to present your work. And this idea that somebody else was presenting your work at one of the juries and you were presenting somebody else's work was a very uh, intriguing moment, I think, in my thinking about teaching because how do you physically or even intellectually separate the self from that thing which you are describing? So this this sort of this this uh, separation of the self allows you to be critical about something. At the same time, having the having the sort of the responsibility of presenting your friend's project in such a way that you do justice to that project also becomes another type of responsibility. And I think this these were extremely new, but also extremely 
um, important experiences that we had at the time. And all of you guys played the game, which was fantastic because otherwise, you know, we would we could have also been in the in a situation that somebody says, I don't want to do this and this is ridiculous. And so I think to 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 take that and allow this critical mass of sep real separation to happen at the time that it happened. Let's not forget it was 1994, 1995, whatever it was. You know, it's it's a long, long time ago. And to physically be able to do that, I think that it has formed all of you in the self uh, critique capacities that all of you of that generation of my students have had and the way that you have gone into into your respective practices, whatever we call practice today. Well, I don't know if you remember, but you always had to give me your lucky stone because I was so freaked out about speaking in front of all these vicious, <laughs> vicious other professors. And, you know, I think the most I was I was I mean, Columbia University was scary when it came to midterm reviews or pinups, because I mean, all these super uh, great minds, all these amazing professors competing with each other in uh, you know, uh, mentioning Lacan and whatever, and 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 that was <laughs> freaky enough. But then at, at at the AA, I mean, people were were there was a whole different there was a whole different ball game. People were gossiping, and it was way more personal. And the student was more involved. And I remember I was hanging on to your stone that it turned almost hot in my pocket because I was so frightened. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I remember. I remember your your, your, your sort of so <laughs> freaking out. But but um. uh, well, I never grew to really uh, like doing lectures and stuff like that. I mean, I like doing them, but I'm not in a good mood beforehand. So you know, I I much <laughs> prefer talking to you via video now, and because I, it's easy going, and we talk about the good old times and all of that. So. Uh, I think I found a new format for myself that's really relaxing me no end. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, talking about all the different schools, you know, you brought uh, two countries together and let's talk about the future of schools like AA and so on in the future. Uh, 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 let's talk about that um, also. But you taught in Vienna. Um, you uh, teaching at the HKU uh, uh, in Hong Kong right now. You were at Cornell. Um, different countries, different teaching, or or same teaching, different different pupils, uh, different students. What what do you think about it after all these years? You know, the sound is really good. I can see. The, I can hear either police or the ambulance going behind you. You yeah, are either or it's the only sounds we have these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's either the police or the ambulance. Yeah, that's right. It's either it's either the protesters go, taking the COVID nineteen people to the hospital. Yes, that's absolutely the nor the normalities of these days. Um, you know, um, it was it was when I when I when I started reading your the the sort of the kind of questions that you sent to me, which dawned on me that um, I have probably taught, I mean, I don't want to say numbers, but I have taught in a lot of schools. And what is, um, what has been amazing for me is that every time I have had the, it, it's been great to understand a different culture, to, to understand a different culture through these conditions and these situations in these different places at the same time through people that mainly i mean in colombia we had a lot of european students as well we had a lot of european students as well as we had american students as well as american students that were marginal in the in the way that they were in the way that they were working from where they were coming from etc cetera, etc cetera. so they weren't they weren't typified in a way Mm -hmm. The same thing goes with Vienna. Vienna was extremely interesting and intriguing for me uh, in the sense that a lot of people were speaking a second language, which was English, for instance. They were, I mean, we were in Vienna and uh, the, the, the school was basically an English speaking school. It's changed later on. It became more of a Ger German speaking school, even though at the time that I entered it, it was actually an English speaking school. And so... Um, everybody was in a sort of an approximation 
this discussions and descriptions were always in in in, in um, approximations so it would allow for the drawing and um the sort of the 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 language of architecture to become more of that place of experimentation because because language in itself was very much uh, very much of a sort of a so-so situation so um i think that one of the things that has been quite intriguing for me in these different experiences is that there have been i have tried at least through my uh, and if you remember this i've tried through my teaching to keep uh, one thing at the top of my list, and that is um, analytical thinking, description, uh, and, <clears throat> and experimentation through drawing. So drawing, which actually becomes a language in itself. This, the capacity of the students to, uh, to um, have a singular capacity through drawing. And allowing for the drawing to become something which actually is their is their lingo anyway is there is the way that they 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 describe yes exactly yeah I did I mean, that I did that I did that with you <laughs> I know <laughs> that gives the meaning that gives layers a whole new meaning <laughs> yeah but I mean that, that's that's exactly what that's what and it come it came from where it came from the AA it came from the time I was a student it came from where um, it was important for us to draw and discuss, not describe only, but discuss through the drawing, experiment through the drawing and allow the drawing to become the sort of the language of architecture. Now, uh, some people say it was because of the fact that at that time in the, in the late 70s and the early 80s, there was not really, I mean, there wasn't really that much of a practice, et cetera, et cetera. We can go on into, you know, into a deep debate about that. But I think that the one terrain that remains still the specificity of architecture is, is drawing. I'm not saying digital or not, or, you know, hand drawing or whatever. I'm just saying drawing as a language. And so <clears throat> drawing as a language has been something that has connected most of the places that I have worked uh, in and uh, students that I have worked with, and even in my uh, in my elective courses or in my um, theoretical courses, it's one of the things that I have been uh, extremely specific about. Whether when I was working, when I was uh, doing my courses on the 20th century um, uh, architects in at Princeton, I was insisting on the way that uh, you know, Kulhas, Mies. Uh, uh, Le Corbusier, Alto, and the moderns, the moderns plus the contemporary modern, uh, were actually uh, looking at scenarios, looking at uh, architecture through their drawings and through the way that they were looking at the city through the drawings. And now, uh, again, uh, the lecture that I'm doing also in Hong Kong is about that. So by system thematizing, if you like, and bringing to the sort of the center of the conversation, the, the, the act of drawing as both uh, a sort of a predicament of design, but also as a way to, to, uh, to bring in some kind of singularity is something that has been really the sort of the, the thread through all of this teaching. Now, um, uh, you know, we can go on about, you know, what, wh how, how is it different in Hong Kong as opposed to, as opposed to Vienna, as opposed to F France, as opposed to, uh, I don't know, America, as opposed to you have uh, international other countries, you know. You have yeah, international but, students, so it's, it, it's all, it's all about how you teach, I think, and what you uh, want to experiment with, no? That's one thing, but also I think that uh, techniques change now. The interesting thing about it today is that we have something that didn't, we didn't have in the 80s, well, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, and that was we didn't have such an image bank in a way. We didn't have Pinterest. Uh, you guys didn't have Pinterest. Well, I didn't have Pinterest at all. I, I, had, I had Bernard Chumi and Ram Kulhas, and uh, 
the folios that Alvin Boyarsky was making, they were our Pinterests, you know. So we were looking at the physicality of something much more than the sort of the, 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 the thinness of something. So I think one of the most important um, lines of interest and, and research for me today is how to teach students to look at images, how to analytically look at images. Because if with your generation, we would, you remember the first po postcard I asked you all to bring, a postcard that would give us an idea of what you think your most favorite painting or drawing is. I asked all of you to come to class the first day. I said, okay, bring your portfolios, what you've done in the last semester so I can know you. But I also asked each of you to bring a postcard. Now, what is interesting for me today is to be able to take this idea of, um, idea of um, drawing to another level. And that, that is right now what is happening in our world, which is uh, the sort of the disconnect, if you like, of reality and abstraction. As much as drawing was a form of abstraction, I think that disconnect is happening because drawing is becoming more and more a description of a reality as opposed to potential of an abstract condition. In your time, there was drawing was about the potential in my time as well. It was about the potential of a the potential of a condition that could perhaps exist. Whereas drawings today are becoming not a potential anymore, but the reality of something that already exists and will continue to exist. So I think these are lines that are interesting to me today to, to work with. But I think it's also something that in Asia, you look at Pinterest very differently than you look at it in, 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 um, in Europe, for instance. I was shocked to even realize that one of our uh, co-students at Columbia is the inventor of Pinterest. So at the last Columbia reunion, uh, when I was teaching in New York in 2007, I went to the re reunion party, which I wouldn't go to if I wouldn't be in New York. And he was doing a lecture. So I thought, oh my God, you know, <laughs> look at that. He, how did he come up with that idea? He tried to explain. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have so many more questions for you. Um, also, by the way, I'm trying to have Bernard on this on this uh, on this talk uh, round as well, and you know I can't wait to uh, to to listen to him what he's saying about teaching and stuff like that. Um, um, how how does all the teaching how how does it influence your practice? Um, how much do you practice? I know that your office is in Paris. Um, how does that work? You know, um, well, the office was in Paris. The office is not in Paris anymore. The office, I closed the office in June 2018. Um, I closed the office, which was called Atelier Seraji Architecte Associé, or Architects and Associates, which basically I got the idea from, I like this television series, which was called Lawyers and Associates. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my um, sort of cor corporate office, which had to be a company, I called it Atelier Seraji Architects and Associates. And um, this, was a, this was an office which went up to about 22 people. And then slowly, slowly, we reduced it and reduced it and reduced it to about six and seven. And finally, in um, 2018, in June, I closed the office. I closed the office because of the fact that I felt that the conditions of practice were no longer that which I was ready to sacrifice my time to. Conditions of practice for me had become uh, sort of a very, very basic routine, you know, competition after competition after competition losing competition after competition. Not that that was a problem for me because competitions have actually made my practice. I have done more than 150 competitions and maybe I've won five of them. But uh, uh, what, were, what was interesting in the maybe 90s and uh, early years of 2000 uh, with competitions was that there was still a sense of experimentation within the competition uh, platform or 
on the competition platforms everywhere, whether they were in Germany, I mean, or in France, it was a very interesting moment in the 90s and the year 2000s. However, I think that um, with the with the sort of with the rise of the culture of image, competitions also began to suffer. So uh, the client was the clients more most mostly the clients were beginning to be after a constructed image as opposed to the potential of something. Therefore, architecture was much more fixed than what that that thing which I would like it to be the thing that I would like to be part of, which was a construction that you do with your clients as you make it. So um, things come in, there are different problems that come in, different constraints that come in, and constantly you build upon these constraints and you build upon these um, hurdles in a way. And it is the hurdles with a very good client, because if you don't have a good client, you cannot go through those hur hurdles, uh, was vanishing. And it was becoming more and more a corporate sort of image of architecture. And slowly, slowly, everything that was being built was already seen, either in Arctic Daily or in whatever or everywhere. So this sort of the media, um, it was the, the, the publish or perish uh, uh, was beginning to be the, the, the absolute reality of um of the of, of architecture in the sense that you had to publish that thing which was not built yet in order for it to be new so i think that there were a series of um uh problems that uh i was not ready to um give into if you like so in order not to give into that those conditions it basically made me to say okay i stop and I began to think about how I can create another type of practice. What kind of practice can I have in this, uh, in this world today, in the world that we have in order to, and more and more, I think that the practice that I would like to have is basically an analytical and sort of, and, uh, and thinking practice. And therefore it is the university. So I'm going back to something. And the one place that I think would be interesting today for me to be able to, if I can, to be able to practice would be within the university. How could one practice within the university without allowing the corporate practice to enter the university? Therefore, which part of the architectural project or the architectural practice could one take into the university as a research-based practice? And which part of it would you take out into the corporate world? So this sort of this 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 um, this superimposition, this overlap place is something that interests me today. So the office is no longer in Paris, and therefore it's in my pocket in a way. It's my office here. It's my office if I come to Berlin tomorrow. So it's it's really it that that has become something which enables me to perhaps one day begin to work with my all of my ex-students in exactly. different places and, in the world. And, and Munich yeah. needs you too. I mean, Germany needs you. <laughs> we, we, um, uh, I, ne I never thought about practice quite as uh, uh, quite like you. Uh, I think as always, you're super consequent in what you do. And I'm, I'm absolutely curious uh, how you will find that possibility to practice within teaching. Um, your um, assistant from Jena contacted me the other day, uh, um, Christina, and she told me about that book that you're planning to do. She didn't tell me very much. She just asked me for, uh, you know, my formerly analog drawings that now I'm scanning. I haven't been out yet, but I'm, I'm trying really hard to do it from, from within the house. <laughs> uh, tell us something about the idea for your new book. Uh, the idea of the book is is actually very simple. The idea of the book is that there's a lot of there's a lot of books on 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 architectural education historically, and they're very well written. You know, they're very well researched. They're very well. You know, they recount the history of um, architectural education 
since the Beaux-Arts and, uh, you know, since the 19th, 18th century, actually, in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, it, they, they come into the present time, both in terms of the European schools, but also in terms of the American schools and how uh, the Beaux-Arts basically influenced the, the architectural education in the, in, in the world. I'm as and as you know, as all of you, are, all of my students and also all the people that I'm, I've been in sort of in touch with in in education. No, I'm not a historian, and uh, I will never be a historian. I'm an architect who practices architecture, who practiced architecture, and I still do in a in a way. But I'm in, I'm totally interested in the way that one uh, has always overlapped practice and education in architecture. So, the idea of the book is to say that we perhaps we start with 1968 when the Beaux-Arts in, uh, in France was, uh, was fragmented into different schools and that the Beaux-Arts had its sort of the guillotine came and completely separated the uh, idea of art and architecture from one another. So um, as I'm not a historian, I'm going to give only a little bit of the spark of the book that starts from 1968. Then from 1968 to 1978, I am going to be looking a little bit through the research of what happened after the, uh, not the demolition, but, but the abolition of the Beaux-Arts in France and uh, in the world. And then from 78 onwards, I go to the architecture school at the A. So I'm using myself the same way that I was in the middle of two groups or three groups of students in Colombia at the A or in Vienna. I'm going to use myself as the cursor, myself, but also where I have been and what I have done. So. In 1978, I arrived at the AA in my first year of architecture schooling. So the, the book is going to start from there and take me through the 70s or the late 70s to the 80s when I graduated from the, from the AA and is going to bring discussions that were happening in architectural education at that time. At the same time, and then it's going to have, the book is going to have a section whereby practice constantly comes into that. And I'm going to be discussing what was happening in practice at that time, not very much at that time. So the schools were feeding practice of architecture at the time. We're feeding not physically in terms of teaching assistants or, or even assistants or as, as, as sort of as labor, but they were feeding them in terms of ideas ideas of mainly marginal practices were coming from the architecture schools. And then from 1983 onwards, when I graduate, I'm going to go into the world of practice. And then I'm going to look at teaching for 10 years because I didn't teach for 10 years. It was only 1993 or 1992 that I started teaching. So about nine, 10 years after I had graduated from the AA. And therefore I'm going to go to the world of practice and bring it back to connect it to what is happening in the world, in the world of practice. And once I start teaching, then I'm going to go from school to school where I have been and bring in <coughs> the way that those schools through, not on, I mean, I, again, I'm the cursor, but what those schools were standing for and what was happening at that time and how practice of architecture was beginning to glide away from the schools and beginning to create in their own terms what they have created now, which are research labs and such as MVRDV, they have their own Y factory and such as um, OMA as their uh, uh, AMO and as and slowly, slowly move into practice, which begins to not display, not re replace, but displace the education of architecture into these firms in order not to fall into the corporate, uh, corporate that, world of, uh, of architecture. So that's how I'm going to take this <coughs> and I'm going to at the end arrive at a series of questions which are going to be critical questions in terms of it is time to completely 
put the cursor on the zero. I mean, not me as the cursor here because I don't want to be a zero at that time, but um, <laughs> put the cursor cursor on the zero because I really think that we are we are at a standstill, and we saw we saw it with the COVID and the online teaching and the online lectures and the online reviews and the concept boards and all of that. We saw the limitations of our, our architectural education in the world. And uh, we see it more and more. And I think, I mean, I don't have, I'm not going to have any answers, but I'm going to have questions for all of you that are involved in architectural um, teaching and education to begin to look at, um, look at a different model. Look at well, different models, not just one model, because, you know. I can only tell you uh, two things. First of all, I cannot wait uh, for, the, for the book to come out and, and because it's, 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 it's describing my whole education and, uh, and I can't wait um, to see whatever result, results come out of it, even if, if that's not fixed. Um, also, uh, I would love to uh, cooperate with you and do something. You know, I really believe in networking. I believe in um, staying in touch with people that you met in life. And, and I think that time, as difficult as it, uh, might be and it, it, it's on it's you know it's different in every country like here we are opening up again I think in Hong Kong uh, uh, it, it's still more strict uh, in terms of corona but I think that time also showed that uh, having a network and talking to friends all over the world uh, keeps you connected and, and 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 it's very important and also keeps the discussion and uh, um, afloat um, I mean, uh, we, we, we almost reached the end of our time or so. We are, we are, we are the bosses here. <laughs> um, do, you see, do you see a bright future for teaching even after COVID, uh, you know, paying these tuition fees at schools and stuff like that? Or do you think people are going to think, uh, let's just do it remote, that's fine? No, I think I, I, it's, I, I don't know. I, I would love to be as a sort of as um as optimistic as you are I, but i am it's not that i'm optimistic or pessimistic about it it's just that i do think that it's going to change completely because um for many years everybody has been interested in uh sort of making and the models of one-to-one -one and making uh big with uh, with uh you know textural things and materials and looking at brick and looking at mud and looking at this we're not going to have a. We're not going to have. Um, we're not going to have a sort of a a, um, a choice now. And when you don't have a choice, your outlook onto things change, and therefore the briefs that you will write are, are going to have to change one way or another. So uh, even if we are going to, we're going to. Even if there is going to be this sort of curtain, uh, iron curtain of COVID that is going to fall on us and say that everything has to be online, we are still going to be, as you said yourself, closer to one another because the network is going to work very differently than before. Before, we would immediately uh, cut ourselves saying, okay, we can't afford to bring in this one, that one, that one. We only have a thousand dollars. We only have this. So that would now, there is going to be a totally different economy that we're going to be working with. And that economy is going to be and, in, and we have our chance now to look at that economy as a very different type of economy, which would allow us even to operate as, as practitioners, even as practicing uh, practitioners of architecture, I mean. So yes, things are going to change. Scale is going to be a very different thing. We're not going to be able to any longer look at drawings in the way we did because lines don't mean what they did before surfaces are going to be very different. So I think that if we begin to look at all of these issues that are going to be completely different because of the constraint of the flat screen, architectural education is bound to change and it's bound to change for a very, very different future. And this different future where I am really hopeful is that it will allow us to think about climate and post-climate and the problems that we're going to have we have already, but we're going to even have in a worse situation in 10 years time, or even now, is going to be looked at in a, in a very serious way and manner. Therefore, I can say that I'm, I'm not so much that I'm hopeful or I'm not hopeful. 
I'm saying that we are in a condition that this is the new condition which we're going to have to work with as a constraint. And the beauty of architecture is exactly that, how we can take a constraint and turn it into a horizon that we can see, yeah, that we can see it as a perspective. So this incredible constraint to become a perspective for us and to become that fine, finite line of the horizon is something that, you know, I've always worked for with you guys and I will always work for. Well, I think architects uh, are taught to be problem solvers first, you know, and also <laughs> we grow with the problems. <laughs> you know, when you have a design problem, I always tell my students, uh, um, you have to go on and try and try and try until it hurts. If it doesn't hurt, if, if it doesn't hurt, it's not good yet. <laughs> and I don't know if that's something <laughs> wrong to say, but I, I, I try to push them. So I have two goals in the future, um, Nasreen. First of all, I want to do a, a great competition with you, and we're going to rock somebody's boat. Uh, and also, I will invite you if to... If we're not going to rock somebody's ass, we're going to rock somebody's boat, okay? Either <laughs> or, <good>. fine. <laughs> uh, and also, let's let's just, uh, you know, do reviews with each other. I was at a review at Tulane University, where usually I do the round between... New York, you know, Pratt and then City College and then Yale and then Tulane. And, and so Tulane was online and there were professors from all over the world. And, and I actually have to say, besides from the sitting in a chair for 12 hours, I actually really loved it. But yeah, it's very flat. So uh, let's grow with our problems. Let's stay safe and healthy and let's really stay in touch and do something amazing. And those slides for the books, uh, for, the book, for, your, for your book is, are coming up. And you stay online because we're gonna do a little, a re, uh, you know, a recap and just see which images we can show of of your work. Uh, whether you even want to show some of your build stuff, which I, I adore, uh, and uh, and stay online. And thank you so much, Nasreen, to to Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Ruth. It was great to see you. And uh, we're gonna have a we're gonna in September or October. <laughs> we're going to have a review together with the students, and we're gonna say. Come on, guys, move around. <laughs> Look, I survived. <laughs> I love you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we can't go to the we can't go to a bar afterwards. That's the problem. <laughs> That's why we invented the rolling bar. We can always, you know, do that afterwards. <laughs> Stay in line. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. <laughs>